What kind of permission? I get an audio signal saying it's being recorded. So that's what you just told me. All right, that sounds like a good sign. Well, let's uh, roll up our sleeves and have the conversation. Frank McGillicuddy, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. I'm, I'm really glad that you were free to have this conversation and I'm really curious to hear what's on your mind in response to this materiality assessment on TD Bank. Um, just before we go further, I thought I'd ask you to introduce yourself, who you are and uh, anything about your yourself that you wanna share with anybody who might listen to this. Sure, uh, my name is Frank McGillicuddy. I am uh, 57 years old, resident of Toronto, married with four children, three daughters and a son. And they're uh, between university and middle of high school age. Um, I have an engineering degree, but I was a horrible engineer. And then I quickly did an MBA after that and worked in finance in the trading room at TD Bank, TD Securities, which is the wholesale. Some people think it would be investment banking, but it's also all the wholesale trading that we did with uh, large governments, pension plans, insurance companies, uh, you know, large corporates, all the, uh, you know, all the, all the, you would recognize, or many people would recognize the names of the clients that we dealt with because it was their corporate treasury type business. So that's my background. So trading and sales, which is a place where we make up the prices between the, the parties involved in the transaction. And much of what I did was over the counter. So it was not involved on any of the exchanges. It was not equity trading. It was mainly foreign exchange and uh, treasury deposit taking uh, some repo and some, and because of that, some bond trading, but that's pretty much it. You know, most of what I did was never reported in the press. Interesting. Great. Thanks yeah. for that background. And do you want to say more about what you're up to now, or do you want to just press? So on? what I'm up to now is consulting tax planning for uh, corporations and uh, accredited investors in Canada. I have some uh, some opportunities in, outside of Canada, but most of what I know is applicable to Canadian residents. So it's uh, what I'd like to think of it as helping uh, Americans pay American, help Canadians pay American level taxes and stay in Canada. <laughs> Probably a quick yeah. summary of what I do. Great way to put it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I always make a point of just explaining on these, since all of these interviews are with people whom I know sort of through one or maybe two degrees of separation. So I always, in the spirit of disclosure, Correct. share how we're connected. So I'll just share that we're connected through our sure. common friend, the lovely Nicole Noxon, and we've had the pleasure of connecting sort of just as friends and colleagues over the last, I don't remember when it was we met, probably six or seven years ago. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it was, it was, it was New Year's in the team. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And I, I've always really appreciated your different way of coming at the world. I mean, it's really visible in your in your Twitter feed, how you sort of experience what's going on in the world and share what I often find to be a refreshing point of view. So that's part of what made me think of you for this conversation, as well as your, uh, your background with TD, which you've uh, just talked about. Um, I also just want to double check. I, I typically ask, what is the nature of your relationship with TD Bank, um, you've got an interesting one in that you're a former employee. Is there any current yeah. state that you think would be relevant just for us to know about in the background? I'm a retiree. I received. I haven't received a pension. I'm not. Gonna, I haven't started receiving my pension, but I soon will be a pension recipient in TD. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, that's my only. And I'm, you know, I, so I'm a retiree with benefits. So I mean, I have some connection to the company, but not as an employee anymore. Right. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction. And with that, I'm going to take us through the questions and I'll, I'll set us up a little bit. We're going to start pretty broad and then dive in a little bit into some details. And the, the broad piece here, just to set the context, as you know, I've been working in the field of sustainability and corporate responsibility for some time. There's a lot of definitions about the future we want, you know, whether it's grounded in the sustainable development goals from the UN, the circular economy from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, lots of different organizations and people saying, this is the future we want. I always find it really helpful to start off in these conversations to understand what is the future you want in as much detail, as much color commentary as you'd like to give it. Well, I, I was, so I did give some thought to what I would answer on this. And, and I think the answer is a blend of 
two different ideas, one of which is very much in the forefront, but one that I think is as powerful and should be given more, uh, you know, uh, headline. But uh, so I think it's um, sustainability, but also uh, simplicity. I think there's a lot of overcomplicated solutions that we have in, in our society, which um, are also part and parcel of the inertia of existing enterprise, organizations, people, processes. And so I understand that disrupting those, i.e. ending those and replacing them with something more simple, um, you know, threatens all the people, all the various stakeholders who either own or work in the processes and the methods that we currently have, which might be unnecessary if you look at the larger picture. So that's, and so that therefore, but I think that's the future, the future I'd like to see is a, a simpler future and, and more, uh, more energy efficient and, you know, less polluting mm. to the extent of maybe can we ever get to no pollution? I don't know if that's possible, but let's, you know, if you're in a hole, stop digging, let's, let's make some progress towards, the no, no pollution state and by pollution we can also include thermal pollution mm -hmm. kind of covers global warming mm -hmm. um don't know if that's possible but let's 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 really put both hands on it and try to make try to see if we can make some progress yeah i love it um and just hovering in the future for a moment in particular on this simplicity one this is a this is a unique theme that hasn't come up yet so i just love to Probe a little deeper there. Yeah, so what would be different? So, so one of the things, that, yeah. So one of the things. Well, so the fact that people drive all over the place and need to go in cars all over the place, if we could uh, somehow break our addiction to that, would be would be helpful, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. even to the extent that we can't fix that, um, the cars that we currently have, like one of the things, the great appeal of the electric car that people don't talk about is the part count in the electric car is dramatically mm -hmm. lower than mm -hmm. the part count in a gas burning car. The recyclability, I'm suspicious, is much, much better in the electric car than it is in the, um, the other, uh, you know, the, 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 what I call ice cars, right? So, in terms of combustion engine? Yeah, in terms of combustion engine. So yeah. those cars, tremendously complex, and we're not very good at recycling them i think yeah. i think we would i think given that there's a battery in electric car and i already know there's tons of technology and effort being made to recycle it mm -hmm. there's no equivalent in the gas tank there's right. no equivalent you can't recycle the horrible emissions of the left of the ice car because it's not concentrated the yeah. point is the great thing about electricity and electric cars is the part counts lower and all the thing is concentrated Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, that, that's one example of how I think simplicity is very powerful and helpful. And, and maybe we can get to a point where, um, you know, we're, we're going to get to a point where we don't have so many cars. That would be nice, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, figure out what are the logistics that need to happen differently than today so that you don't have to drive all over the place. Um, so and, and also, we, I mean, it's interesting, I've seen. The commuting is getting crushed by post pandemic or during pandemic when everyone was forced to trial Zoom and everything else. This now lets people do less commuting. And guess what? They're pushing back like crazy, it seems to me, on people who want to resume 2018 type patterns. Mm -hmm. So this could also improve simplicity, right? If you don't have, you know, I, I envision a, a future where the downtown Toronto which threatens Toronto when I say this, but mm. the downtown doesn't have to exist. Mm. If you have a distributed workforce across the GTA as an example, yep. why don't you have semi-frequent meetings in Hamilton, Orangeville, Brockville, yeah. Newmarket, Whitby, yeah. and you know, spread the inconvenience of commute around the group. You know, your analysis of the group, you've got a 57 person on the team. Where's the locus? Yeah. Where is the geometric best place for us to meet as a group? Yeah. And if you don't want to pick one place, let's pick eight places. Uh, and then, but notice we're not in an office in the same location all the time. Yeah. This is very threatening to the people whose businesses are based on us having a constant office address. So simplicity, but better, better for people, people oriented, 
Um, and, and to be fair, I, I, I just think, I don't think shareholders were ever against this. Mm. They just didn't know they could have it. Yeah. Nobody like, asked. Would you want to invest it? Would you want to invest in a company where everyone's keen about, the, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's break some of the stupid things that we got, be, became used to. Just because some, you get used to someone hitting you over the head doesn't mean it's good to be hit over the head. <laughs> it means you're used to it. That's right. And so commuting is kind of, well, I got used to commuting. Yeah, but it was yeah. a crap way of living your life. Yeah. So now a bunch of us are breaking out of that. And I think it's tremendous. And the youth especially, especially youth in the white collar world, you know, that isn't education or, or, or trades or manufacturing or medicine, which those are all ine- inevitably location-based, mm. but um, they're not ever going to go in for it. Five days a week commute? Are you crazy? What's going on? Why would we do that? <laughs> and, 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 what is, and what is furthered by that behavior? Yeah. And guess what? It's not. And we've, we've shown it all that it's not. Like what kills me, all these guys pounding the table saying, go back to the 2018 patterns. Everything that you wanted to get done in the meantime got done, didn't it? Did the project get done? Yeah. How about the P&L? Did it make money? Oh, yeah, we made money. Yeah, it's okay. It's all good. So like, that's, that's why organizations exist, to successfully do projects and make money. Yeah. Because we did it without the office. Guess what? You can do it without the office. <laughs> and benefit in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And it kind of reminds me of learning to ride a bike without training wheels. If you know how to, hey, we can do it without the training wheels. Oh, this is all great. Don't yeah. need extra parts. So anyway, but who's, who's speaking this way? Like, it sounds like I'm John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness to use a biblical illusion, but I mean, right. And he was ignored and no one listened to him. So I don't know, this needs self simplicity and let's embrace the new methods that if they're better, why aren't we doing them? And if we could have a less footprint on the planet, why wouldn't we do that? And if you could invest in a company that was doing these things versus companies that don't, you're probably going to have happier people, less turnover. Like there should be really substantive benefits from treating your employees in a less bad way. Yeah. I always like to put things in that terms. Like there's bad and less bad, but let's choose less bad. Yeah. Who's against less bad. You can't be against less bad. So I mean, you can't get to good, get to less bad. Yeah. You know, so that's, that's great. That kind of frames a lot of how I look at the future and what I hope for my kids and my grandkids. Yep. Beautiful. I love that future. And uh, uh, one day I'd love to riff more about the fewer cars things. Maybe we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Too. No, well, well, you kind of put me onto that too, right? All these yeah. government oh, programs yeah. to buy cars. Wait a minute. Why don't we get government programs to not own a car? Right. Oh, That's right. Yeah. The $5,000 rebate for an e- yeah. electric vehicle in Canada. And I was like, can I have a $5,000 rebate for taking public transit using the share bike system yeah. and walking? You know, I'll put it to good use. There's, and there's, because you don't buy a thing, you're not eligible for the for the subsidy. That's right. Is, yeah. But you don't well, want them to be making the thing. I mean, you do because of the jobs and politics. But anyway, so we've had this conversation. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. So we're, we'll hold that thought because I'd love for that future that you've just described and that I quite frankly can't wait to live in. I'd love for you to hold that future as a lens through which you view your thoughts on the, the forthcoming questions. So we'll we'll dive okay. more specifically now into uh, what's happening with TD Bank. And I, I've said this to every stakeholder, so I'll say it to you as well, although you actually worked there. So you have a obviously an internal perspective that many won't now retired, but still you're, you bring that experience yep. with you. Um, as much as you would like, your responses might be about TD Bank, the company. It might be about banking more broadly. And I say that because a lot of folks have said, you know, well, all five major banks in Canada, I would say the same thing. So if you want to specify if i know if i know that right exactly so it's there's no right or wrong here i just thought i'd offer that wider uh, right piece if you'd like so with yeah. that you're holding that future as a thought bubble and i'd like you to think about the positive impacts of the company for a moment so the activities the way in which this company is interacting with the world what do you believe that it's doing if anything to create or contribute to that future that you just described? If there's any examples or evidence that you can describe for us. Well, you know, during the time I was there, I was there between 94 and 2019, and the amount of training and awareness around 
wow, you know, social, you know, liberal values and, you know, rights of people. And, uh, you know, it went through the roof. So the place definitely is not the same as the place I joined. They hmm. make a ton of effort to make sure that people hear the message. And we did those courses annually. There was annual, cor- it wasn't just those courses. I did annual anti-money laundering courses, which is a different thing. But my point is, there is definitely an awareness that we're living in a, in a society that's moving and changing, okay? So it's definitely, in my mind, I don't think it's a posture that says we're resisting change with every ounce of our being, mm. right? Like what I'm saying is that they are aware that they're, they're serving a, a society that's changing. Um, I'm not saying they're perfect. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there's an awareness and a posture that says we can't stay the same as we were. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and the way we are now is not where we're going to be in, in a decade. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that that would be true. Um, now, the problem they have, like many existing entities, is they have legacy business, which pays the bills to a certain degree. And so legging between the present and the future you know, the future where you don't do any carbon energy financing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know where they stand on that. I know that they know they have to get to zero. I don't know where they are. I know there's definitely a a constant battle in organizations, broadly speaking, between the current, which might include some things that you wish that you don't think is part of the future, but you can't quite let go yet. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's, I don't think that's unique to TD, by the way, but I do think, TD did change a lot in that direction uh, after the merger with Canada Trust and Ed Clark became the, the guy. And, uh, but, I, but I would say that Ed Clark is on now, and then the extent that I saw it after him, it, it continued to have this kind of posture. And I, I do think it came more from the retail bank more than it came from commercial or wholesale where I was. Okay. Um, I don't think there was any fear in the wholesale bank that our posture – would prevent us from doing deals with our clients. In other words, there was no incentive to be front leading in this respect, but no one at the same time, I didn't think anybody was afraid that where we were, where we were was bad. It was definitely a peer, a peer awareness. You don't want to be the last one, but there yeah. maybe not as a lot of point of being the first. Um, so like, don't be bleeding edge. Don't be paying you know, oh, we're going to shut down all the gas and oil and gas financing to be clean, right? And then nobody else does, and you're waiting eight years for everyone else to catch up. Like, you're leaving a lot on the table in P&L. So, I can get that. Like, it's not – but I don't think that they had any thought that they would have influence over these companies by doing it. It was more a question of when will the answer be zero? When will the answer be mm. 20% of today? Like, it's a gradual mm-hmm. process. Mm -hmm. I clearly, I don't think they're trying to get more of it. Now, that being said, I'm not there right now during the Ukraine war and Russian oil totally destroying the anti-carbon mode that we had before that. And I don't know Mm -hmm. what that does, but but I'm giving you my sense of what I think they are, which is to say not change unfriendly, but probably uh, not, probably not expecting themselves to be the leading edge of these things. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I have another opinion about banking, which is most people who are in it kind of find strange when I say it, but they're really part of government. Hmm. They're heavily regulated. Uh, the Canadian banking system is heavily regulated by the federal government. And, uh, you know, it's a, a lot of benefits. But in a sense, we probably will be like government in how we move forward. It won't be the first Mm-hmm. That's what I think. I don't think that would be first either. I mean, it's got a lot of. It's, it's hard to move these big organizations. I think the smaller organizations can move faster into the kind of future that I'm talking about. And and I even thought of this during pandemic. Like small companies that started up in the pandemic learned how to work without an office. Yeah. Well, yeah. when will the, so that back to that again? But the point is, when will they quote learn to use an office unquote? <laughs> Maybe they never will. Right. On the business. Maybe it's not. Needed. And so, but banks and government, while they lightened up on their use of offices during the pandemic, they're probably not going to zero office next week. 
mm-hmm. versus the company that started two years ago is still zero office, even though it's grown from five to 20. It's growing with no office. So the banks, like government, are like, well, they're fixed in how they are, and they can't really. So anyway, I'm not sure the long meandering way of saying, I think they're on the right page, but I don't think they're the ones who are leading the charge. But they're certainly, they're, uh, if you think of it as an inertia, they're moving, they're moving like the center of gravity is moving with them. Right. right. Yep. Yep. And I think I follow, but I'm going to quite naturally play dumb for a second here and just say, um, when you say over the years you were there, you saw a lot of evolution in terms of um, training around liberal values. I, I'm going to beg sure. you to unpack that a little, just knowing words like liberal. Oh, and sure. Liberal so sensitivity to, uh, to otherness and, and particularly in terms of human rights and, uh, you know, LGBTQ. Right. I think there's two S plus is added now to that acronym. But the point is, that's a thing that was not evident when I started. And it became clearly evident that we, it's in our customer base. It's in our employee workforce. Right, we're right. acknowledging it and it's part of it. And by the same token, uh, you know, the, the idea of doing business the right way, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I struggle to say that they were environmentally friendly necessarily. Mm. Um, I think that they're going to effectively track the economy as the, the you know the less good things of the economy shrink, that will shrink in the books on the book of business of the bank. Mm-hmm. They're not going to really drive it. I think. I, I, I wrestle with that okay. because I know they have a bunch of different uh, you know entities inside them, like the wealth management side, that's supposed to replicate, say, the indexes. If they've promised to replicate the index, that means they're going to have oil and gas and mining in it. Right. And by the way, mining will never go away because we always our crap at recycling that's how the bank's fault so we're going to keep digging new holes in the ground to get more stuff out of the ground and what all that means yeah um oil and gas hopefully can be reduced to a mining type thing where we're putting holes in the ground to get oil so we can lubricate stuff or make plastics or whatever it is that we can't do without you know what i mean where are we gonna where does that break down i don't know i don't think oil and gas is going away 100 percent, but let's shrink it a ton right so I don't know if the bank is leading that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like, in a sense, they're kind of tied to being what's in the market, what's in society now. And as, it, as society moves that way, like let's say, as an example, my kids might say, oh, we're never buying any more plastic bags, like zero. And so reduce their plastic you know, footprint and they you know, don't use gasoline cars and they have like everything in the house is electric. There's no natural gas mm-hmm. dryer or natural gas stovetop like and and that over time will shrink the amount of business that's associated with all those things Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if society moves there the bank will be there as well kind of hard for the bank to lead all that i think yeah that's interesting unless so unless their federal regulator started to attribute different risk parameters to different industries which i don't think they have done so far but it's possible that federal policy could, you know, infiltrate the federal bank regulator to say, yeah, we want to put the schneid on oil and gas. Mm-hmm. So make that really like expensive risk capital. Well, if you did that, bank would respond like 100% they would. They would go, yeah, it's a higher expense to have loans outstanding to that sector. Shut it all down. I don't right. want any part of it. Yeah. So there's a way that the banks could be steered. I don't know that the people in politics understand this. Right. So that's uh, maybe that's a, a revelation here is that you can steer the banks if you want. Now, you understand that if you did that, other banks globally who were not regulated by the Canadian banks right. would it's behave so differently and go up. So, so it would just come from a different source. But the point is you're forcing, you're forcing a, a behavior that you want to have in the Canadian bank system. You can definitely do that through the regulator. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, that to wax political for a moment, that circles back to the the kind of policy we see is more about amping up electric vehicles versus tamping down oil and gas. Uh, But perhaps there are policy activities in the works that I'm simply not aware of. Um, I I don't think the government works as fast as the people who are seized by this vision 
would like. Mm-hmm. By the same token, I don't think banks are working any faster than the government. But I right. think that if what's funny is in, in domestic policies, for sure, Canadian federal government has way more power over Canadian industry than the American president has over anything domestic or any kind of thing similar. Like the prime minister of Canada is a dictator of Canada. They mm. can do what the hell they want. Mm. And as long as their party is elected and stays elected, now the next guy can come back, next guy or girl can come back and reverse all that because they're a dictator, it. right? That's yeah. how, so, but if you kept it in place for long enough, it'd be hard to go back. Right, right. And do you know offhand? So I think there's not enough enough awareness of how fast Canada could move if Uh people were willing to do it. Yeah. So do you know if TD would be lobbying in any regard around that kind of, um, that's sort of an off-the-cuff question. I can. Oh, well, I I think in general, they would not like to see the regulator behave in what, what sounds like a partisan manner that none of their global competitors face. Right. So they would argue, oh, can't do it. It's going to hurt our profitability. And of course, the regulator could go, I don't care. Pound sand. You're a Canadian bank. We're the regulator. We're saying this. You don't like it? Tough. Right, right. I mean, there isn't near... (laughs) They think they can push back, but the banks are all in a depopulating mode. Like, I know that they're, you know, currently at 70,000 employees of TV, give or take, Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's going to 35,000 over 10 years. That's going in half. Mm-hmm. So, because they're going to continue to use automation and technology to yep. reduce their human footprint. For sure. And by definition, that reduces their political heft because they have fewer people working for them. Right. What are you going to do? You're more and more a creature of computers and silicon chips and the regulators' rules from the government, which you can't escape. You can't, you can't shrink that aspect. So when it's, it's because they used to have a large number of employees, that's a lot of households that they sustain, if you will. They're kind of like uh, an employment, like employment matters in terms of politics. So yeah, yeah. They, they, them, they themselves are going to take themselves out of that influential role because they're going to want to get rid of people because it's cheaper to operate with fewer people. But in, but in democracy, that's bad. Right. Less influential. They also, by the way, have that their shareholders, their their shareholders are the pensions and insurance plans of the country. So they still have that's always going to still be true. Mm-hmm. So they are intertwined with a bunch of different things. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. my point is if, if the regulator came out and said, Yeah, we're declaring war on this sector, whatever sector you want to pick on, and, and the, the banks currently make a lot of money from it, well, that's going to also have a value on the valuation of the stock which is mm-hmm. going to affect the insurance plans, the pension plans. You see how there's a host of other stakeholders who would join the banks and saying, this is insanity. Right. Bad idea. Let's not do it. So there's a lot of, yeah, well, this is back to the inertia and how things get resisted. Yeah. And it wouldn't necessarily come directly from, from TD Bank or the banks. Right. It could come from other powerful stakeholders who are also going to suffer. Although, to be fair, they're not. I mean, it's 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 a hard argument. They can say they're going to suffer. It's very mm. hard to prove something in, in the future, right? Yep, yep. They're never really called on that. They're allowed to bray their incomplete sentences of their case, <laughs> and no one really calls them out and goes, "Well, let's let's think about what this, how this could be good." Like, right. you know, for sure, it's going to be bad. Like, you're taking the vent that's going to be bad because this year you're going to get paid less. But maybe we're all better off if you get paid this year less so that in 10 years, our country has advanced, blah, 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 blah. Like, let's have a full conversation. But that's not how the media works. And obviously, interested parties always talk their own angle. Right. Yeah, by so, definition, that's their interest. And, well, but, 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 but I think a lot of the people who would oppose them maybe don't have enough education to know Well, there's the regulator, there's who's owning your shares, there's your employee count, there's your blah, blah, blah. Like, there's a bunch of stuff that's there. Um, And I I don't necessarily know that that's going to answer the problem, but it wouldn't hurt if when you engage with these big corporations, you understand the tentacles of where they're all all across the economy and society and politics. Yeah, They're not simple. They don't stand alone. Oh, it is super interconnected. 
Um, yeah. This is, this is great. And so I'm just going to bring us back to a specific question for a second, but, but please keep going yep. in these interconnected ways. Um, that was your response to where they're having a positive contribution to the future you want. But of course, you touched on a lot of elements that you could say are potentially positive or negative. Totally cool. I want to just sort of yeah. restate the question and see if it if it prompts more. So that was coming sure. from what positive impacts are there? Other positive impacts or negative impacts? So ways that you think the company might be undermining that future that you described. Um. Yeah, it's funny. I I don't see them really undermining. I see them being. I think they're neutral to good. Okay. I, I don't really see the. I don't see there's a lot of undermining. Um, I'm trying to think how would they be undermining? Because you know that they're contributing to all the political parties, right? Like it's not mm -hmm. like they're playing favorites. Like right. everybody gets, everyone gets a a shot at some of that. Um, they're. Uh, I know that in TD's case, their marketing is tied in with their charity. That it's all very friendly, and they definitely have a green uh, tint. To their marketing about you know how friendly they are to their customers, how they're good to their employees, and how you know the whole green thing has been a real uh, bonus for them marketing wise because that's their mm -hmm. corporate color. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm trying to think of how I've saw anything that was undermining this stuff. Can I? The leave only the way you could. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is the only way I can see is that the bank industry. Um, I think overpays a ton of people and myself included, right? There's no reason why that money needed to be paid out in compensation because the fun and the power of the job was such that you wouldn't quit it anyway. And if I thought that way about my own level and I wasn't even at a super high level, there's no way those got any of those people would quit. Like not a chance. So Interesting. Are they contributing to inequality in that sense by having these big pay, you know, compensation things? And if, again, if the regulator said, right, nobody in the bank can make more than the prime minister, huh. you, know, you, you know, you can imagine people jumping out of windows, the whole thing, right? And you'd just be like, well, hey, if you don't like it, you can quit. Right. Guess what? They wouldn't quit. You're an EDP of a bank. Are you kidding me? You're not quitting over money. Are you stupid? Right. Now, there will be some that would quit. Okay, but I bet you'd be surprised how many didn't. And, you know, nobody, they keep telling us all the time, nobody is irreplaceable. Right, right. So right. some people quit. So what? Someone else gets promoted. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. And so anyway, that's, I don't think that's going to happen, but that's just a, as a what if. And I don't think the banking industry and sector would be wounded mortally if what I just said came down the pipe right they say you're all civil you're all you're all civil servants not in the union and you have great benefits and by the way the average person in a bank wouldn't be affected because they don't make that much money that's right so it would only be the top two thousand people in the bank right and then yeah. you're saying we're we want to we want to have a culture of equality and you know we don't think that that's that's necessarily the way to go and if you think that's the way to go you can leave. And you leave. I love it. Right? Yeah. Oh, hey, so, so I would call the bluff on some of that. Now that I'm out of it, I can say that. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 I mean, yeah. You know, and, and I, 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 by the way, I don't think there's a high probability of what I'm saying going to happen. But um, oh. so I'm just trying to reach for how are they undermining? The only thing I can possibly think of is that I think income inequality is not well served by the banks and the insurance companies paying the people as much as they do, Yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, but to be fair, I don't know that it would solve the inequality problem, but it would take mm -hmm. away one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard, because, you know, they do, I think they make a lot of efforts to be good corporate citizens. I don't think, I don't think they're, I don't see People, you know, conniving and behind closed doors doing dodgy stuff. Like I never, right. I never saw that. So, right, right. If it does happen, I never saw it, and I, and I think I would have heard about it if it had. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me check in with you on one piece that has been coming up in my desk research on this, and this was part of what I was 
um, querying kind of behind the scenes where they're for sure their marketing is very green. Uh, lots of chatter, definitely lots of charitable stuff, but I'd like to sort of set that aside and say that's nice, but it's not the business model. It's just sort of nice things they do with the money they make is they spend it in nice ways, but looking at how the company makes money, right. Um, I was finding it rather tricky to follow the money uh, on their might, might be loosely termed green finance. And so one of the things that looked at just at a, not even at a glance, at a deep dive where I just could not see how these things connect because the financial statements don't make it easy to make the connection. On the one hand, there's talk of green bonds, sustainability bonds, sort of sustainable finance, and some numbers are put to that. And they're big numbers, but they're not, you know, in the, they're nowhere near as big as the rest of the bank's numbers. But then over in the other part of the balance sheet, you've got um, that about 10% of the business is um, revenue from the wholesale banking. And a good chunk yep. of that comes from things that are definitely not green finance. So for sure, the oil and gas stuff sits there as like, mm, not green finance. There's a big chunk that's mining, which is probably not green finance. The biggest chunk of the wholesale banking, at least in the most recent uh, financial disclosures I could find, was in the financial services or in finance was the industry sector. So that's kind of a black box when it comes down to, is it you know, financing the future that we want or not? We, we can't really tell. So I guess my sort of naive and somewhat blunt question is, do you think they're undermining by financing more of the stuff that we really know needs to stop than the stuff that we really know we need in that future. Yeah, I think, I think um, the problem, what you're describing really is there's no constituency for change. Hmm. There's a massive constituency for the current and inertia and, mm -hmm. you know, defending the current turf. Mm -hmm. But someone says, let's change things. And there's no constituency that's invested in, you know, getting into that other lane from the current lane. Um, so that's, that's probably the problem that I think we're kind of talking about. In terms of non-transparency of, of the financial statements, effectively, you need to meet somebody or get to know somebody who's a financial analyst, like uh, one of the analysts in, on Bay Street who looks at banks and insurance to try to figure out more because without that kind of specialized knowledge, I think there's almost zero chance you'll be able to figure anything out. But that being said, I don't think there's a lot really. I think I'm more suspicious that it's a lot of marketing than it yeah. is real. So that's my suspicion. And, that, and that's not because I think they're evil people. I think it's because no. the economy itself still isn't as clean as we would like it to be. Right. Right. And as you and said, the other ones... And, 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 and the Canadian economy, and the Canadian market versus the economy, the Canadian markets represent a ton of global mining capital. Yeah. Way outside. I mean, people think Canadians make hockey players. <laughs> we make way more mining than we make hockey players. Yeah. yeah like globally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and, and oil and gas clearly has to go, but we have a ton of resources that are there. Yeah. Right? And so, yeah. it's yeah. all going to shrink globally, hopefully. Nobody wants to shrink early, and obviously we've seen what's happened since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The valuations have gone through the roof and all the energy stuff. Yeah. Um, it's kind of perplexing and hard. But, I mean, it's just that's what markets do. When something moves and changes, it adjusts the valuations all over the place. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know how you're going to get specifics on that. I think I, you're going to have to figure out a way to get access to the people who know Yeah. Um, to, to try to explain it to you. Um, and, and probably it would probably be useful to look at a decade ago and where are we now? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great. See, see if you can find, cause, cause year over year, probably not much change, but maybe over a decade there has been, I'm pretty sure that all the Canyon banks have less energy now than they used to have. Hmm. Um, and, but I think there's a spectrum within the banks themselves. And if I recall correctly at the time, I thought Scotia had more oil and gas uh, on a, like a represent on a, on an average basis compared to the other banks. So uh, I don't know if that's still true. It probably still is because it's hard to change those things. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Um, and the challenge with the green finances, it's just not categorized. It's very it's not well-defined. 
Yeah, it's this yeah. kind of mushy thing. So there isn't a line item where there is a line item for energy. There is a line item for mining. So um, all to say, right. thank you for the cues there. I, I, I will keep us moving forward and I'll do more due diligence on my end and see if I can get some meaningful numbers there. But thanks for the, the prompts, very helpful. Um, I'm gonna ask you a kind of impossible and silly question. And the reason it's impossible and silly is I think it's slightly ridiculous to offer a numerical ranking to a complex dynamic system like a, a global bank. But I nonetheless okay. have found it really helpful uh, to ask this question and hear how you and, and your stakeholder peers answer it. So I'm gonna ask you to give me a number but what I'm really looking for is why you give me that number and you know some commentary. Right. Normally I, I share my screen here, but I'm gonna kind of walk you through visually what's going on and then ask you okay. to tell me in your sort of mind's eye what you would do um, with this number. So what I'm looking for here is a ranking where zero is no net negative or positive impact and plus five would be the most possible positive contribution to that future you described. Minus five would be the most devastating undermining of that future you described. And right. I'm gonna expand it a little. If you could see my screen, you'd see that I've got a two by two matrix that gives us two. No, I, I think I, I saw the two by two. So that's where you plotted a bunch of responses. That's right. Google survey. So exactly. I, so I, know, I'm, I'm, I, I understand you're doing a two by two matrix. I think. Cool. And then the, the dimensions are grossly oversimplified where the vertical is really looking at the ecosystem impacts. So you could call that environmental, biodiversity, you know, all, climate, all the uh, things we would put in ecosystem health and the horizontal would be societal health, the people piece. And of course we know those are intrinsically linked. So even trying to say there are two dimensions is a little bit goofy, but I, right. I made up the questions. So <laughs> I've been finding it really yeah. interesting hear what people say. So where would you tell me yeah. to place a TD bank bubble representing the company now based on how its business model is or isn't contributing to that future that you want? So it helps, I think, to put context in it. Like they're not big tobacco. Okay. Mm -hmm. like, there's, there's businesses that clearly do not help society. Big mm -hmm. tobacco should be shut. So there's an example of, to my mind, one of the black, and another one I might add might be kid cereal, right? Like yeah. things that, can we get along without this? Oh, damn sure we can. And, you know, wow, we'd be a lot better off without it. But So I think those are examples of things that, now, there's an element of the bank that is possibly in that space of things we could do without, which is people who gamble on stock markets and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? I don't think it's a dominant piece, but I would definitely say that they have some exposure on that. Um, uh, but uh, I can't say it's overwhelming in the sense of what else they do. I think in general, the bank is probably closer to zero or one for uh, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about what's, what, 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 what's the, what, which are the four lines we talk about? Well, uh, yep. The, so the, the horizontal is social. And the vertical okay. is uh, ecosystem. So you can tell me where, like, how high up. So I bet you, I bet you would be like, if you use the coordinates one, one, or two, two. So they're in the upper right hand okay. corner, but okay. close to the origin. And the reason that's true is it reflects society. Hmm. You can't get too far. I presume if you, if you summed everything in society, you would get the origin, I think. Huh. Okay. So you, I mean, that's what I think. Of. That's what I think you would get. I mean, you get tobacco and kids cereal over here and you'd yeah. have other things that are, you know, like I have a friend who works in solar. So clearly they're like trying to help do all that stuff. That's good. You know, yeah. um, uh, there's a, a, a range of products and services that would be all over the place, but I bet you summed it all up. I think you'd probably be close to zero the origin on, on every, like all of society. And we're trying to move this thing Trying to move, you know, if you could, if you could uh, plot it over time, mm. the our origin part is hopefully moving up and towards the right. Yeah, you know yep, yep. And therefore, so is but, the bank, as you've been saying that they kind well, of. Well, that's my with, point. It probably this is back to my point of I don't see how it. I think it's at at worst neutral, and at best a little bit ahead. Yeah. And and I put them a little bit ahead on the basis of, 
they are unabashedly in favor of, you know, queer folk, uh, people of different colors, different ethnicities, like, because they want to sell to Canada and they want right. their inside to look like the people they're selling to. Like, there's yeah, a business yeah. reason why they're doing it, but they are doing it. It can't be denied. Yeah. So I think, I think there's a positive there because I think that's a lot better than saying we only hire white males, which would be <laughs> horrible. So they don't. Uh, so I, I got to give them credit for that. Um, a lot of their business activities reflects what the economy is doing, what people are doing, right? So in Canada, that's a lot of trucking companies because we're, we're spread all over the place, right? Rail and logistics, a lot of energy and mining because that's what we have. And, you know, a lot of the corporate relationships are with global mining companies. So it's the mining all over the planet that these guys have an edge on financing. So they, they're going to reflect that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, a, a, to take another example, foreign exchange trading. Is that good or bad? I don't know, but I'd make a lot of money from it. Hmm. And if they don't do it, someone else will. So that to me is like a neutral thing, right? Right. Like it's just a, you're providing a service that has that kind of has to be done in, in the modern global economy and modern global markets. These are things that occur. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, and the and and in terms of the environment, I think they are going to head towards. Fewer people, fewer offices. I don't know how fast they're going to get there, but I would suspect that the next leaders will see it as a huge opportunity to unburden costs in the organization. And, you know, it's funny how, let's say someone spent 20 years in the bank raising their career and they get to the top and it's like, okay, now we're going to shut down all the offices and, you know, reduce all the office footprint. And people go, yeah. that's crazy. You were raised in an environment that is. Yeah, but now I have a chance to move the needle, reduce costs, make myself look like a hero. I'm going to do this because it's, a, it's, it's so easy to do. Yeah. Everyone knows how to use Zoom now. What was the previous guy waiting for? Idiot. Right? So yeah. I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity. So I think that I think that the next leaders of all the banks and all the white collar jobs, actually, all the white collar jobs that aren't location specific. If it's not the current leadership, then I think the next leadership will definitely whack office costs and stuff. And so this will lead to the when you when that happens, you're going to have to redevelop all that all that infrastructure. All that infrastructure is going to get it redeveloped, whether it's residents, I don't know what it is, but yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I and also if they see they can get if, whenever they can see they can get by with less people. They want to do that. And I think that is where the future of a lot of information-based businesses are, is that fewer people, you can say it's going to be artificial intelligence, you can say better computing, uh, you know, smarter people who are, can work better. Like, I don't know why, where it comes from, but there'll be fewer people in the bank, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So okay. they're heading to a lighter, a lighter employee base and a lighter, I think, office base. And if yeah. you think that's good for the ecosystem, then they're going to be good. Yeah. Oh, I'm sort of picturing. And they're sure not going to adopt, you know, let's heat our offices using coal. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I'm just trying to right. think about what would be the thing they would do that would be like so retrograde. And I can't see it. Right. I can't see them doing those things. Yeah. Operationally, no. So, it's the pro yeah. it's the portfolio where I think the potential, like right. as you're describing with the oil and gas. And, sector. And, and, and I, but it's probably it's probably fair to say that they're probably organizationally more progressive than their loan book and their financing activities. Does oh, yeah. that make any sense? It makes a ton so, of sense. And that's really where they're yeah, so, is where they put their money. And, and, and of course they always market the part that's the best. Right. So yeah. they're going to take the best part of their portfolio of activities and promote that, which yeah. they do. And that's fair, but you know, there's another part that they can't move faster because you know, and, you know, I, 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 some tobacco company needs a loan. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna compete for that because that business is not illegal. Yeah, it's not illegal business. If you're the mafia and come in, you can't get a loan. But if you're a tobacco company, you can. Yeah. So that's right. I don't, don't, I don't know how much of that is in the Canadian banks because we don't have a lot of tobacco companies in Canada. But a tobacco farmer, mm -hmm. not getting turned away. Yeah, Nor, yeah. And if society says that he's not illegal, then I guess he shouldn't be turned away. What are we waiting for, though? 
Like, really, what are we waiting for? Why is there still tobacco farmers on us? Uh, right? So I'm not blaming the bank, though. No, 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 I gotcha. Okay, this so is So this great. comes back to why the bank can't move faster than society. But if someone got to Ottawa and said, right, nah, we're trying to get on tobacco farmers. Well, of course, all the MPs who have tobacco farmers would be like, are you not? Right, so, yeah. But that would, if that would happen, the bank wouldn't lend them. So on that note, actually, this this is a very good segue into what's about to happen next. Um, I'm going to push us into the to the last two questions, and uh, it really yeah. is a good segue there. Um, they they're more about scenarios. So we're setting aside the impossible two by two matrix and an effort to rank, and we're just going to go into yeah. imaginary world for a little bit. Um, and okay. in the, the first imaginary world. Uh, I actually just got a bit of news just before um, this call started. This just in: you are you've been made in charge of everything. There's, it's the wow. Frank. Yeah, it's the Frank world. Nothing is in the way. There are no limits. What changes would you make to the company? You to make the company. Wow, wow. Um, that's a hell of a question. Make the companies. I think I would flatten the organization, get rid of levels, and put the senior people closer to the customers. Mm. Um, uh, so that would be that would be a thing I think they they need to do. Um, don't know what that does for our contacts and whatever, but I think that would be a, a change that would make them more customer responsive and less experts at the politics of inside their company. Hmm. I, I think most companies would benefit from having less politics and less value put on being the expert of internal politics right. versus oh. what does the company actually do? Yeah. Which nice. is if you don't serve your customers well, you know, I mean, and then, and then Kevin says, well, it's an oligopoly. It doesn't really matter. Well, you say it doesn't matter, but let's try it. Yeah. Let's put more people out in front of the customers and make sure that they act that make the customer the boss. And I don't think it's just banks, right? I think there's more, more, if you did this, I think more companies would become fundamental creatures versus this blend of theoretical, uh, you know, inside baseball, inside the company and, and fundamental. So I would want to have companies be more fundamental about providing the products and services and less about the cut and thrust of internal politics. Yeah. Yeah. And to that end, I might make all compensation transparent. Nice. Everyone knows everyone makes. Yeah. You want to make that? This is what you got to do. Yeah. But, and again, it wouldn't be, make, obviously the point is you don't, just make it transparent. Like right now, it's at the top is very transparent. You can see what the, the head of the bank makes, mm -hmm. right? But that's not really helpful because most of us are never going to get to the bank. So it's kind right. of like, who cares? I mean, it's a, it's a start, but they yeah. haven't continued it. My point is the sunshine list of the Ontario government could be brought to the bank. Nice. And, and I would just say, we're not going to not show what anyone makes. We're going to show what everyone makes. Everyone gets to see what everyone makes. Yeah. This would also contribute to less politics, a lot less uncertainty. I know what Sally makes. I know what Bill makes. And they're at that level. And guess what? Now we're probably going to get rid of gender-based preferences and stuff, right? Because like, well, you know what I mean? It would, yeah. it would be threatening as hell to HR because all of a sudden half their job is gone because everyone knows everything. So they have to, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I love it. And, and you know, a lot of people would go, well, I want to make the same as him. I say, okay, we're going to pay him the same as you. Well, that's not what I meant. Well, guess what? <laughs> that, too bad that you, you know, you want to get paid the same as him. Now you do. He gets paid less. And, yeah. and he quits. Okay, so he quits and we deal with some of that. Like, in other words, that transparency event would trigger a lot yeah. of probably healthy turnover. Yeah. If you're only working here for the money, we don't want you here anyway. Yeah. And then it would just be so normal. This is, so this is back to the point of the fundamental of business. Like, are you doing 
Are we creating good businesses? Are we doing good products? Are we providing services that the customers want at a price that is appropriate? We can't starve. We got to get paid. But if we're ripping their eyes out, that's not right. Like, so get, but get more fundamental in your business. And maybe so, and I don't know if it's obviously, you you put me in charge because I can do whatever I want. These are my crazy ideas. That's what I would do. I love it. Well, I, I wish it weren't an imaginative scenario, but unfortunately it is. And the news has just yeah. come back that it's, that wasn't You're true. You're not, yeah, yeah, it's not true. Not, not yet, but, uh, but there is another scenario that's come along that's uh, almost as fun, which is um, you have a direct line with the CEO and I, I believe is, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, but Bharat Masrani. And yeah, Bharat uh, Masrani. yeah. he takes your calls immediately. He wants to know what you think. The thing is he's a pretty busy guy. So he's only got 30 seconds. What do you tell him? 30 seconds. What do you say in 30 seconds? Uh, geez, what do I tell him in 30 seconds? Uh, wow, that's hard. It's really hard to try to get it baked down into that quick what you would tell the guy. Um, I guess the most important part that I would tell him was you don't need to pay the people at the top where you're paying them. Their compensation is as much on power and influence and rank as it is money. So, and, and those things won't change if the money goes down. So even if someone quits because they can go to New York and get paid more, there's somebody who wants to do the work that they're doing for less. To recognize the non-monetary compensation that exists in your company and use it to full advantage to reduce politics. Nice. That's what I would say. I love it. Well, alas, that kind was of, also yeah. That was also a, a fictional scenario, although probably in your case, there's yeah. more, more chance than uh, than most average folks who didn't actually well, work together. I'm actually kind of close by one guy to the head of TD Securities currently, Riaz Ahmed, who's in the running to be head of the bank. Oh, so, interesting. Cool. Well, not impossible that. I could have that conversation. Yeah, keep that thought I'm, handy. I'm sure he would, I'm sure he would not do it. <laughs> it's very, yeah. very, it's very high risk, disruptive, and they those guys don't play that game. Yeah. And the incentives are certainly not rolling in that direction. Um, no. Well, and Frank, that was the last question I prepared for you for this interview, but I'm curious if you have other either questions for me or, or other thoughts you want to put out on the table as we're imagining TD Bank in the future that you described. Um, well, I think there's a big challenge in the company in the, that they, they're generating a huge amount of U.S. growth, mm -hmm. and the U.S. is clearly changing from the place that we thought it was a decade ago. Uh -huh. And what kind of cultural change does that bring to TD when you have Americans increasingly becoming predominant in the company? It's a Canadian American company, not a Canadian company. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, and, and just, you know, obviously within the last three weeks, Supreme Court of the US and Republicans and Democrats and everything there. Mm -hmm. The Americans, I know a lot of people I know think the Americans are headed to a civil war. Hmm. Um, God forbid that happens. But if it does, all these Canadian banks that have these massive U.S. footprints are going to be in serious crap. Mm -hmm. So um, versus the ones who don't have any, like I think, I think Scotia has almost no United States exposure. Hmm. You know, so if the U.S. turns into a pot of crap, what does that do for all the Canadian banks that have invested tons of money and whatever in there, and then all, and all of a sudden it's like it's a war zone, right? I mean, no one, no one, well, it seems to me, no one could predict the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So now what, nobody could have predicted the U.S. Civil War. So, uh, I mean, I hope that doesn't happen. But I mean, so, and that yeah. threatens, by the way, the future that you're trying to have, right? If you have massive social upheaval and warfare, yeah, people don't give a shit about the, you know, the global ecosystem warming up and, you know, you know what I mean? Like it really yeah. localized, you know, we, we've seen it in terms of the economy, like everyone's going to localize their economy on the back of pandemic and or logistics disruption from this war in Ukraine. Mm. 
that's not going to improve the efficiency of mankind to localize your your economy. I mean, in some sense, yeah, you don't want to ship 10 cent goods thousands of kilometers, you know, to, but I understand that part. Seeing that go away won't be bad. Mm-hmm. But um, if you don't let efficiencies and specialization take place and trade those things intelligently across mm-hmm. society and humanity, that means you're going to have 18 things and you could have had three. Yeah, yeah. Back to that and, simplicity. Yeah, so duplication and waste and ah, damn, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so I think, that's, I think that's, a big, that's a big challenge, I think, for the future of humanity. You, know, you talk about going to simplicity and not having things be so complex. Uh, localization might be bad for that. Hmm. Right? Like, you know, uh, yeah. I, I just don't, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real problem. And, and I wouldn't have thought this three years ago that political instability threatens global advance towards less energy, less pollution. Yeah. But I'm, I'm kind of worried now that it might yeah. be. Now, thankfully, I'm in Canada. So we're remote. We're far away from all the places that people screw things up. Um, you know, I've always thought, you know, war between China and India. Well, it's not my, not my backyard, thank God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and even to the extent of war in the United States, not high odds you're going to come cruising into Canada to do anything. Mm -hmm. right so we're actually canada's really benefits even if in in the massive downside case that we have a lot of civil war and unrest that totally derails the green movement because people are just like i don't care i gotta i gotta do what i gotta do yeah yeah that but that will be a massive threat to the green movement i think yeah gosh that's interesting i mean that's probably a whole nother conversation i'll I'll just offer a little seed for the for the final moments here which is that maybe of course i don't know the future and i'm not involved in the civil war so and never have been but my my sense when i look at times of conflict is that has also been a time when waste was almost zero and local ability to uh produce food, for example, increased. I would hate to see that happening because of crisis or like staving off death by starvation. Um, But I do see the notion of like, oh, we forgot how to save seeds. We forgot why the water went from A to B and that was a good thing for our, you know, overall, um, our sort of watershed. Being able to remember that and do things about it uh, seems to happen in those times of conflict. So um, by well, no it's kind of funny if you, think, it, just... if, if, if you think back to what Rome was like in 1700 or 1600, it's a place that used to be like the seat of the Roman Empire, but mm. it was a ruin, like crumbling mm. masonry and nothing there. Mm. Very hard for people in you know modern world to think, well, yeah, that could happen in Philadelphia or Toronto. Right, right, what? right. Yeah. What? Yeah. 300 years from now, people come here and go wonder who built this? How did it get yeah. here? And, yeah. that, and they're looking at the TD center down in King and Bay. Yeah. Like, or, or some pile of rubble that used to be. Yeah. <laughs> those, those it's, not, it's not that well built it, either. I, well, no, but no, as soon as the pumps fail yeah. in a northern climate, as soon as you can't evacuate water out of the, uh, the basements, the freeze yeah. thaw cycle destroys the towers from the bottom. They'll fall down. Yeah. Yeah. So they won't actually see the towers. They'll see a pile of rubble and glass and steel. Yeah. Uh, you know, and all our roads will become, uh, you know, linear deposits of gravel. Mm-hmm. Like a map of gravel paths all over because we don't maintain the, 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 the top of the roads for a couple hundred years. Oh, yeah. All the concrete gets exposed. All the rebar rusts and the whole thing just becomes a, a, a path of gravel in 500 years of no human maintenance. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that, so it, I, it's helpful for humans to consider what Rome was like in 1700, 1600 and go, do you want that to happen here? Cause it can. Yeah. Yeah. And what are the conditions that make that be likely? Yeah. Anyway, that, so that's, wow. I didn't even, I didn't even know I was going to have that thought when I got on the phone. Yeah. With you, so I appreciate uh, this, uh, this survey has been really helpful. <laughs> yeah, I'm really grateful for your time, Frank. It's it's always a treat to hear what's on your mind. You bring such a unique perspective. And in this context, obviously, you bring 
a lot of depth and insight and expertise. So I'm super grateful. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to pause yeah. the recording here unless you've got any further thoughts you want to throw in. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm done for the day here. All right. Nice.